Hey, what's going on guys? It's Tom Mason here, back with another video. And today I wanna to talk to you about some of my favorite pictures from last year, 2023. So let's jump into it. Right now to get started, when it comes to shooting images professionally, of course I take hundreds, thousands of images every year, but in terms of what I'm really looking for is just one a month that I'm extremely satisfied. If I get that, I'm more than happy. You know, of course I deliver projects with clients and everything like that, but in terms of work that's gonna go into the portfolio, a single image every month that I look at and think, do you know what? I'd put that on my wall is really good enough for me. And I just want to tell you that because, you know, if you're out there struggling to get thousands of pictures, you're thinking, God, these people are putting pictures up on Instagram every single day and it's overwhelming. It's too much. No, just stop. As long as you're creating one solid picture that you're super happy with every single month, that's more than enough. And to be honest, if you're putting that much effort into one single frame and it's like something that's truly beautiful, you want to put on the wall and you want to look at every day, then you're probably creating images in a much better way than those who are churning out a shot every single day just to put something up on their Instagram. So don't, don't worry about any of that. Right, so let's dive into these pictures. Now, I've roughly put them through the year, although we will come back to certain ones, um, to just kind of show you the year progressing. And the first one that I'm going to talk about is this, that obviously I will put up for you guys, is a shot of a tawny owl in this beautiful natural tree hole. Now, I went out looking for um, owls last year. I was actually looking for shorted owls, longed owls, a location that I know. You know, I won't talk about the location specifically, but yeah, it's a location that's great for owls. Um, and, you know, this beautiful hole in the tree where the tawny owl is sitting got there really early in the morning it's actually one of the first shoots i did with my new 600 mil f4 so as you can imagine i was extremely excited to try it now i got there and i framed up and the hour was pretty small distant so working with like 850 mil on the tripod using the teleconverter in i got a shot but it just didn't give me the habitat that I wanted. So I ended up stitching four pictures together, um, you know, in portrait orientation, stitching four pictures together to give me the shot that you see here. Panning across on the tripod, one of the most important reasons for having a tripod to do work like this, to keep everything rock solid and to, you know, allow you to frame up in different ways. I spent literally half an hour to an hour moving my tripod incrementally to the right, to the left, just to find the perfect gap to see the um, the owl in the tree, and then working out that when I pan to the right hand side, you know, to work out you know my nice interest um, to the side of the rest of the panoramic. I love having more space in my wildlife images. If you know any of my work, you'll know that generally I like to be more environmental in my shots rather than like a clean, straight portrait. And I really like this one. I kept it reasonably dark and moody because that's exactly what the day was like. I don't like to over brighten things and make it look like a totally different day. It was a dark, moody day. Um, and yeah, really happy with this shot. You know, of course I took hundreds of images to make sure I had the absolute perfect one, but coming out with just one panoramic shot, yeah, one I really like and a great one to kick off the year. Now, the second image is of an otter swimming past. It's a river that I've been to many, many times. The light was really beautiful. I had this nice shaft of light that was coming down. And just as the otter swam through it, just kind of illuminated in the gloom. It's a really cold, bluey kind of day that just looked wicked. Um, Underexposing to make sure all the background was kind of dark and the otter was just lit by that piece of light. Once again, using the 600 F4, just kind of getting used to it. You know, the whole of last year, in terms of, you know, learning a new piece of equipment, it's always important to do that. So trying a variety of different subjects with the 600, just get my eye in of what I actually want to create with that lens. Um, this was 600 at F4, you know, probably like 3,000th of a second to make sure that I'm, you know, adjusted for the really harsh light that was coming through. But uh, yeah, a shot that I really like. and. I always like spending my time with otters. They're just such fantastic animals to work with. Now, my third picture, the first hair picture that you'll see today, um, you know, it was in great conditions, um, probably pretty early in the year, I think it was end of February time. Um, the fields are low, very, you know, minimal kind of interest to them but woke up and just saw this really heavy fog. And I was just like, oh, this is gonna be amazing. Got out early, positioned myself up in one of the fields that I know very well, and just waited it out. Using my low mini tripod, I've got this great little Manfrotto low tripod that I should do a little video about at some point. I'll 
I'll put that on the back burner to do. Um, it's great, you can hold my you know, 600 mil, the Z9 really low to the ground and just working with that and waiting for the hairs to come out. One of the great things with mist is of course, things don't spot you as close. So I had much better close encounters with the hairs, but I really like this more environmental shot again. The environmental shots, something I really like. Um, positioning the two hairs down in the corner, but keeping them very clustered together. The reason for this is they're almost one subject, not two. If they would be separated further apart, you'd bounce between the two and you wouldn't have this kind of location that you really kind of stick to in the frame. And just keeping the rest of the frame with the mist, showing the conditions, yeah, the frame that I definitely liked from this year. Now, Picture number four was on Havagate, but it's not a hair. It's a two oyster catchers who were just in the perfect position. I came up and I've been watching the hairs for ages. The sun had started to set um, and I really didn't have much light left to shoot any other subject. I turned around and saw these oyster catchers making their way along the water's edge, um, but they were backlit. The reason this is super important is because of course the light reflecting um, is much higher, great exposure, and then I could underexpose to make sure that I silhouetted out the birds in the foreground. I positioned them low so they just got a little bit of grass in front. You've got the band of white that provides perfect kind of silhouetting for the birds, and then a heavy black piece at the top, just because I liked how that looked graphically. Um, the two birds pointing straight together um, narrows you down to a point. Again, it's two subjects that isn't necessarily compositionally correct, but because they're both looking into the same point, it narrows you to a single area of the frame that again, works to hold you in that picture rather than losing you to the outside. If they were looking the other ways or anything like that, you'd probably get lost off from either side of the frame. Um, but I just really like that composition. Central, bold, nice silhouette picture that I'm certainly happy to have in the portfolio. Something a little unique from my time out on Havagate. Picture number five is of a hair. We are at five, aren't we? Yeah, I think so. Um, is of a hair and I love this picture. It's a super easy frame as, as it looks face value. But you know, if you know about photography and you look at this image, you'll immediately see that it wasn't taken with a long telephoto lens. You know, it's actually taken with my 24 to 120 at around 35, 36 mil. Yeah, just perfectly close to this. And then there's actually a bit more to it than just a single frame, um, you know, exposing. So I've got a little bit of the light up in the right hand corner, but then the actual natural look and brightness, even though it's in shadow, is coming from an off-camera flash. Um, my SB700 that I've got through um, a diffuser. Um, I'm also using a slight warming gel on it just to give it a bit of lift and um, to bring the whole thing together. Using F11 to get some real depth on the hair, see every single detail. Simple frame, but one that I really, really like. Not the style of shot that I'd have done many years ago, um, but certainly something that I'm pushing into these days. Uh, and just, you know, great memory of a moment for me and a shot that I really enjoy to look at. Now, number six is totally different. Um, my girlfriend recently started a PhD studying kitty weights and it means that we've spent a lot of time looking at kitty weights over the last year heading up to newcastle you know time bridge fantastic place to see kitty weights um but it was a bit of a problem for me you know i had the z8 I had the z9 with me I was trying to get these different shots and i couldn't get the camera into the right place you know the birds are really confident right along this urban bridge i want the background of the city to get my wide angle in i just you know the bars were all annoying and in the place i couldn't use the camera so I ended up taking this picture on this, my Nikon Coolpix A. And I wanted to throw it in there just to prove that you don't need all of the camera gear in the world to make great wildlife images. It's about applying your knowledge of when to use a subject, when to use a piece of equipment to get the shot. And the great thing about this is I could squeeze my hand through the bars, turn it round, keep it flat to the bridge, and then compose over the top and make the shot. It's got a 28 millimeter f2.8 lens on it. It is a DX camera, um, but you know, I picked this up secondhand a while ago because I've wanted one of these for years and I will do a video about this camera. But um, yeah, it allowed me to get my camera into the right position and trigger the shot. Um, I used a slow-ish shutter speed. I think it was about 120th so that you could get some movement in the car that's coming down the central. And I waited literally like kneeling on the bridge with my hand through the bars for this shot. 
for a good like five ten minutes till a car would come right past and take multiple shots with the birds looking at the right angle with the light on the back it takes a while but yeah super happy with this shot i love the contextual nature of the image the darkness and the brightness that is coming from the actual lights that light up the bridge i had to wait for the cycle to go through green purple red white that's when i could make the shot as well as it combining with a car coming past and me in the right place with the birds looking the right way it took a while, but yeah, you know, you can do wildlife photography even on a compact camera. You've just got to have the vision and the kind of idea to bring the shot together. Really like that picture. Number seven is a water vole from my favorite location in the UK, that is Rymead. The reason it's my favorite location in the UK is because it's pretty much where I grew up. I was back up in Hertfordshire, having moved to Cornwall a while ago, um, was down at the reserve and just using the actual Nikon 300 PF, trialing it out before I headed out um, to photograph polar bears, was working low angle, and because I can use it with a flip screen, like this on the back, I could drop the camera really uh, low to the water line in the spot where the water voles are and just get these really nice images. Once again, using kind of panoramic techniques, I'm shooting a frame, moving across, taking another frame without changing the focus so that I can stitch the two together and get that panoramic shot. I feel it just gives me a bit more of the environmental context with these images uh, and something that I just really enjoy shooting. I've been doing it ever since I was out in Africa taking those pictures and it's something that's really been drawn into my work. You know, nailing that focus on the water bowl, the tiny little eyes, cute little leaf that he's chewing on with that context and kind of the lily pads and everything. Just a shot that I'm super happy with. Moving on to a project that I've been doing for a number of years. If you've been on my Instagram, seen anything like that, you know that I've photographed foxes for a long time. I was out in the graveyards this year with the 24 to 120, being very specific to not use long telephoto lenses, um, you know, to push to get something different. A lot of the time I find that if I restrict myself to a certain style of lens, you know, I will have a telephoto on another body just in case something incredible happens, but I am usually Usually specifically working to get a certain style of frame and here I was using like between 28 and 35 mil to get contextual shots of the foxes moving through the graveyard um, you know they're really comfortable with people that they're, they're all they're there all year round but um, just by lying down knowing a couple of locations I've been working with the fox cubs earlier that year um, just position myself up and I really like the fact that the the graves in the background kind of tend down in a nice line the cross is just above where the fox is and it's moving just looking out into the frame that gorgeous light on the uh, face as well now some people would say Tom it's a really annoying piece of grass in the way and yeah I think 19 year old 20 year old me would say exactly the same and be super annoyed with that but now for me it just gives a bit more reality to the image when I look at it that's really what it's like you know, they are looking through the grass, they are moving through to, it isn't perfect. And I think by having a little imperfection within images sometimes makes them more interested than when they're too clean. I mean, early on in my career, everything was clean. I wanted super out of focus foregrounds and backgrounds. I wanted nothing to be in the way of the subject. But these days I don't really shoot my images as much like that. Of course, I still shoot those same frames, but these sort of images interest me far more. And that's why this one, made it onto the list. Now, of course, we can't talk about last year without polar bears. If you haven't seen the polar bear video, I'll put it up here, up there, wherever it is there. Um, you know, you can go check them out. But just two favorite frames from that trip, you know, short trip out there, but I made two images that I was super happy with. The first one, um, you know, this, you know, silhouetted shot with the rim light of the polar bear. You can see the hump of the polar bear. It's walking across. There's nice white lines that trail basically the eye line and the feet line of the bear. Simple shot with a 600 F4, you know, on the tripod, getting as low as possible to make sure that the background has that kind of drift so it is out of focus a bit more separate your subject uh, and just really focus in. Underexpose using um, the, uh, what's it called? Highlight weighted metering to make sure that I don't clip the highlights uh, and then just pushing up a little bit because it tends to meter it to, you know, gray rather than actually white. So I usually push up a third to get the exposure perfect. But yeah, really happy with this shot. Simple image, but easy to do if you're in the right location and you've got a polar bear in front of you, of course. The next one, another polar bear image, you know, 
this probably is just kind of a dream shot for me. All the spin drift, all the snow going everywhere, that polar bear just looking into the frame with all that drama and movement was just excellent. I loved being here. It reminds me of just that moment, seeing that polar bear at a distance, the whole rawness of the environment, slightly letterboxed um, so that, you know, narrows, it moves the um, the gaze of the polar bear across to that kind of environment as a whole. Um, yeah, pretty simple shot to do, keeping that shutter speed pretty high, probably two thousandths of a second. F4, so I've got a nice out of focus foreground, um, but you still get a lot of detail in the, the snow because of the distance I was working at. Yeah, converted to black and white because I wanted to reduce any color distractions and focus you on the kind of the drama, the bear, and just the environment as a whole. And of course, to work with that portfolio of work that I did um, whilst I was out in Churchill. But yeah, absolutely love this shot. And again, it's probably one that's going to find its way into a print somewhere at some point. The next shot is actually a reasonably recent one of um, Shorted Owl. Been out photographing Shorted Owls. It's been a fantastic year for them here in the UK, especially um, in East Anglia and around here. Um, loads have been about. I've done Shorted Owls many times, you know, photographing them in flight and all that sort of stuff. But I got a really nice shot of this perched owl. Again, panoramic, three stitch pictures, nailing it on the tripod with a 600 mil panning across, stitching them together. A simple frame, but that more environmental and contextual approach is what I really love to do. So I'm super happy with this shot. Nice bit of like evening light, just giving it a little bit of pop from the background and those muted colors that just really give you that kind of Finland environment that is somewhere that I've spent a lot of time, I absolutely love, and shorted hours are just, I mean, they're wicked, right? Now my final picture is one that I haven't shown at any point through this year. And it is without doubt my favorite frame of the year in terms of its kind of drama, its interest, its shot as a whole. And is of this, a sparrow hawk in my girlfriend's parents' back garden. And it was shot on Easter Sunday that is just wicked. I went outside um, and my girlfriend's dad came and we said, oh, just found this dead pigeon in the garden. I was super excited. I was like, must be a sparrow hawk. I've seen them in their garden many times. So I ran to the car and I grabbed out my camera trap that of course, you know, as a professional wildlife photographer, I've always got a camera trap knocking about. Um, grabbed out my scout, um, my Kinesis scout saber trigger, grabbed the Z6, uh, went to the garden, used my mini Jitso tripod, positioned it all up and um, frame up on the dead pigeon with the, you know, the, the garage and the, you know, the greenhouse in the background this lovely kind of just beautiful garden image and then positioned it got the tra trigger working used my foot to make sure that everything was going well and then thought to myself well we'll see if it goes off from experience if a sparrow hawk hits uh, prey and drops it loses it gets spooked off it they will kind of head off and kind of wait around to see if they can come back down that's basically what I was hoping would happen um, as luck would have it, as we were all inside tucking into uh, Easter Sunday lunch, Sparrowhawk came down to tuck into it and, you know, dragged the pigeon about, pulled the feathers out. I've got a whole series of images um, off the Z6, you know, great camera. Shot some pretty great pictures on that camera. I was using it in silent mode um, so that it didn't make any noise, you know, it could shoot like a burst of images to get the shot. And yeah, this was just my favorite looking up to the side the light was coming through the hedge this is done you know there's no flash here I'm just using in on aperture priority minusing by two-thirds of a stop to make sure I don't clip any highlights and then obviously as the birds turned its head the light has come through the hedge hit it perfectly and just I love this picture and the reason I love it more is because it is completely accessible for anybody out there to go and shoot you know if you've got any level of like outdoor space, local park, like anything like that, you can make an image like this. It just takes time. It takes, you know, a moment to happen and for you to react to it, to use your knowledge about wildlife, your knowledge about photography to go then create the shot. And, you know, it was lucky that it all came together. I had all the equipment with me because I'm always prepared and carry it with me all the time. But moments like this are dead worth it. And yeah, 
for it to all come together to get a whole sequence of shots and get that perfect image of a sparrow hawk in the back garden tearing apart a pigeon, that has to be my image of 2023. And I hope it's one that you guys quite like. So there's a quick rundown of my, you know, some of my favorite pictures from last year. I hope you took away some kind of ideas, some inspiration, maybe some tips to shoot your own stuff this year. You know, I'm always looking for about 12 pictures a year. And if I come back with that, I'm super happy, of course. I want more than that. But if I can come back with that concise amount, images that I want to put on the wall, that I want to have up, that, you know, will be great for magazine spreads or unique shots that, you know, other people just don't have, that's super exciting to me. And that's what wildlife photography is all about. And in many ways, it's even better when you can do it with smaller equipment or in the back garden. I think if you can make a great image that's different to anyone else's, in your home back garden, then you really have developed your work as a wildlife photographer and you're ready to go do basically any other subject that you want. Well, that's gonna be it for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video, I hope you enjoyed the pictures. Of course, if you've got any questions, you wanna know more about a certain picture, how I did it, whatever, drop it down in the comments, more than happy to uh, help you out. Of course, if you like this content, if you enjoy the videos, be sure to subscribe, like, it really helps push this out to more people. I'll be back soon with more videos. Um, and yeah, of course, if you do wanna join me for a workshop, be sure to join the mailing list. But yeah, until the next one, guys, get out there, enjoy your wildlife photography, and I'll see you soon.